Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Duckman TV and Weekend Warriors. I've got a special guest on today uh, from Rouse Hill Rams Athletics Club, Bob Gribben. Bob, how are you going? I'm doing exceptionally well. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. And really appreciate uh, Monique doing all the legwork to make this happen. So I've been chatting to her for a while. She yep. is... Uh, a very enthusiastic uh, media person for the club and she just loves the club. So I was glad to be able to uh, have a chat with you and talk about the club and some of the achievements that the club have and things they're doing at the moment. Excellent. Yeah. Happy to oblige. Yep. Yeah. So you're about to head into a new uh, season for athletics coming up. Can you tell us uh, when that will start and how people get involved if they want to get involved? Yeah, we start in, um, in two Two weeks, 15th. Um, yep. We run Friday nights, every Friday night up until the middle of December. And then we break until the middle of um, January. And then we run, continue running to, to the middle of March. Um, and we stop the week before our state state championships. But to, to sign up, it's it's fairly straightforward. If you go to our website, um, ram, ramsathletics.com.au, there's a link there to the sign-on page. You actually sign in through Little Athletics, which is where the registration's held. They keep all our personal data, so it's uh, it's nice and secure. Yep. And and we run under their rules and and regulations. Yep. So, how big is the club now? So you said they've been around for about sixteen years. Yes. Yeah. We we we're running. Last year we ran. We had it was five hundred five hundred and fifty athletes, which is a big number for us um i put the 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 number down to registrations opened in august and august happened to be right in the middle of the commonwealth games and it was all over television (laughs) talk about free advertising and that really bumped our numbers up um looking at where we are at the moment i'd expect we'd be around the 500 mark this coming season which is which is really good um we run a competition every Friday night, and there are some fairly sophisticated logistics in getting through that many athletes, but um, we handle it well. We handle it. we run a, a two-week program, so you run um, week A and week B, a bit obvious, um, but you run different events each week. Um, typically, you're always going to be do, doing running events, um, but one week you might do throws, the next week you might do jumps. So... So we, we, we vary it. Yeah. yeah. So with Little Athletics, obviously, the whole premise of Little Athletics in general is to get more kids doing sports, get moving, and yeah. you want to get all the kids to try pretty much all the different events and disciplines in athletics, don't you? Not just the, the glamorous ones that are running ones, right? Everyone wants to be your same bolt. Or That's right, got, 100 metres. <laughs> yeah, you've got the jump ones now. You've got lots of people want to be... Uh, Michelle Janecki or Kathy Freeman's and all this sort of stuff. Yep. So Sally Pearson's, but um, yeah, is is it hard to get uh, the young kids trying all the different ones, the shot puts and the javelins and all this sort of stuff as well? No, they all they all jump in. They have they basically have to do them because it's part of the part of the program. But we've had some really good um, throws athletes over the years. Yeah, um, we yeah. had the Australian junior or under 14 discus thrower. And he was 13 okay. when he was throwing. <laughs> and he was, yeah, he was throwing 52 metres. Yeah. Now, if you can imagine throwing a kilo, 52 metres, that's an awful long way. Yeah. A normal kid his age would be, a good one would be throwing 20. Yeah. So to have a kid throwing 52 metres, that really is impressive. So we do have, have, have the good, good throws athletes. Um, we've had some good sprinters over the years because we keep their times. Um, typically we're running and we get, we get runners through the state, which is good. We run in a very competitive zone, which is the Northwest zone. And to, to get to state, um, my son was 400 meters. So I'm more familiar with 400 meter times. Um, a 14 year old is running mid 50 seconds. Yeah, the the state times will be down in the low fifties, which for a, a fourteen year old boy is it, it's pretty quick. Yeah, um, where I see most of the little A's kids really benefiting is at their schools carnivals. 
you can tell who the little athletes are because you look at the way they they run. Running, running is taught. You have a natural running ability, but if you look at the way an athlete runs, you look at the way they lift their legs, their foot lands always under the body and it just touches the ground as they keep moving forward. Um, that's taught. And we like to, to coach the kids so that they run well. Then they do very well at their school carnivals. And it also helps them in their other sports, soccer, rugby, any running sport. Um, yeah. You know, soccer, it's always first to the ball. By coming to athletics and learning how to explode off the start, you get to the ball before the other player. Yeah, it's um, twice the speed. It's all, and all the running is over 10 or 20 metres in soccer. It's not 100 metres. It very, very rarely is a 50, right. 60, 70 metre run. It's a 10, yeah. 20 metre thing. But most sprint races are one at the start. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't get the start right, you're left behind. I mean, people look at um, blocks, right, where my son um, first started using blocks, and I said to his coach, do these really make much of a difference? And he said, oh, probably about 0.2 of a second. And I thought, no, that's not very much, is it? And he said, well, at the end of the race, it's about one and a half metres. Right? Yeah. Because if, if you think of a, an athlete, they're normally running um, about seven metres a second, a 14-year-old yeah. boy. All right, so it takes them time to get up to that speed. And it's how you explode off the start and you learn how to start low and lift up into your sprint position. And yeah. if anybody looks at Usain Bolt and all the other athletes, he was an exception, um, they always start low and about the 20 to 30 metre mark is when they they come tall. Right? Now, yeah. Usain Bolt was too tall for a sprinter and he never won the starts. He always beat them in the, in the straights because yeah. of his height. He'd have been a better 400, in my opinion, <laughs> a better 400-meter yeah. runner. But if you but if you can learn how to start and explode, and you're playing soccer, you're playing rugby, netball, any of the ball sports, you get that start, you beat the other kids, you're there. You know how yeah. to do it. I, I wish I had have had some sprint coach when I was younger because I, uh, I'm six foot five, and uh, even as a young guy, I used to run upright, start upright, and my nickname is Duckman because I waddle around like a duck when I'm running. <laughs> but um, run very straight legged, run very upright, and I could run 100 when I was 14. I remember running 12.26 seconds, but I still couldn't get in the top four in my school. Um, there are some quick, <laughs> quick, quick guys. Yeah. The start, the start was everything, eh? Because we got big quads and could run people down, but. If you drop 10, 15 metres at start, you're never going to pull that back, that's, ever. That's, that's right, yeah. And and that's what we like to, to teach the kids. And that carries them, th carries them through their other sports and it carries them through um, through their school competitions. You, you don't have to be doing athletics because you want to become an athlete in athletics. You're doing it because you want to learn how to compete. And that's yeah, what we yeah. teach. And, and the other good thing about um, athletics is it's an individual sport. And what we try to get the kids to do is it's not necessarily about winning. It's about beating your previous time. Personal improvement, yeah. Personal improvement. Because if you, you're you looking at the under kids, you've got an under nine. Well, an under nine, nine could be, he's just left eight or he's about to turn 10. Now, the kid who's about to turn 10 should beat the one who's just left eight because of the level of maturity. So yeah. it's... It's it's unfair. So we try to get them to measure against themselves, look for improvement, and I mean that that's where our focus is, and that's what we think the kids need to need to do. And that's what I like about athletics. Even when they get to the Olympics, uh, they'll talk. You get any of the people that are in, oh, I'll come eighth. Yeah, made the final. It was great. I came eighth, but I run a PB. So oh, did you? Well, that's the yep. best you could do. That was that's the best right. that you could do. And yeah. you've done your best and you've still made the finals and that. So it's good to be able to have those levels of measure and improvement as well as like achievements and come first, second, third, podium finishes. Not like everybody likes that, but it's good that you can see and measure improvement over a period of time and you're competing against yourself as well as other people as well. So, yeah. And, and the athletes seem to um, 
get that instilled in self in themselves and and at the end of the competition and the start of the competition they're all shaking each other's hands congratulating each other yeah. you know it really is um a pleasure to see there's none of this it, it's not as competitive as, as the team sports yeah but i think but i also think it's harder on the kids in some ways because if you're in a team sport and you lose then it's the team has lost if yeah. it's athletics if you've haven't won then it's it's personal it's you yep so it's mentally it's, it's a bit different it's yeah. yeah hard to download that and uh and compress it all when you're a young person that oh i, I didn't win but that was me that didn't win oh the team won yep. and had success overall australia won the olympics or whatever but yeah well I, I still didn't win so you you would feel a bit disconnected from some of that i imagine yeah. too yeah so which is why we just just focus on yourself Focus on your on your times, and that's what the kids seem to take forward. Yeah. So, how did you get involved with athletics? Oh, mainly my son. Um, yeah. He, he wanted to he, he wanted to run, and he was he was naturally quick. So um, we looked at, at different coaches, and then we looked at different clubs, and then we joined Rouse Hill. But for us, it would have been a choice between Riverston or Rouse Hill, from where we live. And we chose Rouse Hill because it was a bigger club. Um, yeah, and he, he went through the club, became club captain. I have I was involved in sport when I was growing up, um, very much in equestrian, show jumping. Yeah. And I used to ride my horse around and knock down rails and someone would always come and pick them up for me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's my time to give back, you know. Yeah. When I was younger... People were, were supporting me through the sport and now I'm giving back to other people so they can do and have experiences that I had in my life. And, that, and that's that's an important thing to do. So I noticed that as I got older, being involved in soccer and rugby union and cricket, different things, uh, to be able to give back is, well, I've got more out of the last couple of years in sport, I think, than I did in all the time I've ever competed and played and won competitions. Um at the end, it's very uh, insular, and you look like, oh, all right, I got the competition, but what's what's next? Well, the next bit's given back to other people so they can have the experiences and enjoy that. It's, yeah, and that's something else to get out of that. Yeah, because if I mean, if if volunteers aren't there to to set the competition up, it doesn't happen. You know, yeah, so, you know, with soccer, someone has to come and put the corner flags out. Someone has to put the nets up. It's the same yeah. with athletics. Someone's got to put the jump mats out. Someone's got to put the timing gates out. It just doesn't doesn't happen. You yeah, know, that yeah. we don't have any fairies that do it for us. So, in um, in regards to the size of your club compared to other clubs in the northwest area of Sydney, uh, how big would your club be compared to like some of the other clubs in the area, Riverstones and the Hills and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, Hills is the biggest. They're running. I think last year they ran about a thousand. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rivo Riverston runs. I think they were running about three hundred, two to three hundred last year. Yeah, um, yeah. Hawkesbury ran about three hundred last year. Winston Hills is about three hundred. So we we're probably the second biggest in the northwest. Yeah. Um, Hills run on a Saturday, so they have a much bigger window. We have yeah. to get all our athletes through in about a two and a half hour window. Yeah. So we we start at six thirty, and tiny tots, which is your three and four year olds, we like to get them out of there by seven thirty. Um, sixes, sevens, it's sort of eight o'clock, um, and then the older kids, we 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 push them with more events, and they they finish a bit later. Yeah. But we're yeah. very we've got a very tight window and the logistics of moving people to get them through the various events before we run out of out of time whereas hills they've they start early in the morning and they run till two three in the afternoon yeah so yeah that sound like they have a very big setup i was uh, chatted with steve whelan before it was very good with yes the yep. and um they they just sound very big so and he said compared to them that they're comparing themselves with like cherry book and that as well so other associations and uh, clubs that are big as well and he yeah. said there's not that many uh, clubs around so which surprised me I thought there are a lot more little athletics clubs and athletics clubs 
and uh, they wonder. It's, uh, it, it's very hard getting the grounds. I mean, we are the only club in the northwest that has a um, an IAAF size track. Right? Hills has a a four hundred meter track, but theirs is very is round. It doesn't have the the true athletic shape, so you're not running the same bend. Yeah. Um, which for kids, it, it doesn't matter, right? But if you were yeah. running, um, you're going to the Olympics, you need to be running on a um, the correct corners because you're training your muscles to to run around a certain bend. Yeah. Um, Winston Hills, which is the other club in the hills, its track's only about 350 metres. Yeah. So for a 400 metre, they actually have to run past the start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's very hard finding the space. Um, we're just lucky that at Hill Centenary, we have the space to put in a, a full size track. Um, so we run we run nine lanes. Most of the others run eight lanes, and the reason we run nine is so that we can run um, laned races, which are your 400, 200 meters, and the eight hundreds and above. Um, they may start off in lane, but then they merge to the inside lane. So yeah. we run the inside lane um, for the distance races and the lane races on the outside, which means we can run two races concurrently. And then That's a big our... deal to be able to do that too. Oh, yes. That, well, that, that's how we get through the numbers. Right? Yeah. If we couldn't do that, um, we, we'd have to cap our numbers at about 400. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we run a 110-metre straight track in the centre. <laughs> So we're running our straight track races again um, concurrently with the with the circular track. Hill hills also have a, a straight track in the centre. Yeah. So that yeah, well, that, that's good. So I where I grew up in Warrington, um, it was literally down the road from Warrington Little Athletics Club. And they had the pleasure of having like one of Penrith's turf turf cricket ovals that they could use. So oh, right. it was full athletics purpose in uh summer around the yep. cricket so all the athletes would be done before lunchtime and the grade cricket would come out but it was manicured good <laughs> good quality so it was all good quality stuff so i always uh, everything was there I, I wish i had tried it more other than school but yeah it's just those things so uh, the people you're attracting into the club well, what sort of cash money you're getting them so it would help for rouse hill as a growing and developing area you're getting a lot yeah. of people from the ponds and the surrounding areas as well now the ponds have got their own um, little athletics. They're in yeah. they're in Blacktown LGA. Um, they've got a big membership. They run about five hundred. They yeah. run yeah. Um, again. They don't have the the size that we have, so they actually run over two nights. They run yeah. their tiny tots on Thursdays, and uh, their older athletes on the on the Friday night. Um, our catchment at the moment's coming from coming from Rouse Hill from Box Hill. Um, we're getting quite a few from from Box Hill, um, but that's the basic area where we we're coming from: Rouse Hill, Kellyville. Uh, we do have some from the ponds who were longer term athletes with us. Yeah. So does it help that that's a growth area? Like, is that going to be sustainable for the club to continue to get uh, younger, new, younger people in? year after year and stuff like that over a long period of time? Oh, I, I I think so. I mean, the growth's going to be going on for quite some time. So uh, I expect we'll be running around about the 500 for the next next few years. Yeah. Maybe that, maybe then it will start to slow down. I don't know. Yeah. So you've got people like Monique as well that is uh, very, very good with the uh, social media stuff and all that as well. Oh, so she's brilliant. That, yeah, does it help having someone like her in the club that's really good with the engagement piece with the community and let people know what's going on events-wise and everything? Oh, it, it's key to our success um, because she knows how to use the social media. Um, she'll queue her posts up so that they she knows what the peak times are for people looking at social media. Yeah. So she times everything to go out at the right time. She cues it. Um, she knows how to get get herself up on the on the the list so that people search yeah, with a search engine SEO, optimization. SEO yep. stuff, search engine yeah, optimization. optimization. So, yep. Yeah. No, she knows all that stuff, <laughs> and she's um, and she knows how to work it. 
yeah. and she knows how not to put too many out and she gets everybody on the committee if it's a key post she warns us so that we can as soon as it goes out we can all start liking it and sharing it which then gets you higher up the list <laughs> yeah within facebook so uh no she's she's good and she also has the contacts with with people like you like yourself so that we can yeah. be doing this yeah so. well well that's the idea well idea of what i do is to try to promote those different community-based sports and community-based sporting organizations and people that uh you wouldn't know about otherwise so and try to promote that because i would like love to see ideally everybody have a footprint where they get noticed in the sporting world because not everyone's going to make elite level sport if we're serious about it and uh they deserve recognition for what they do so yeah yeah uh, it's, it's just yeah it's just like with with soccer, um, I always wanted to see the kids come off the field with a smile on their face. Yeah. It didn't matter whether they won or they lost, you come off with a smile on your face. I mean, one, one of my proudest moments with um, with athletics was was actually the school state competition, uh, 400 metres. Eight athletes started, only seven came across the finish line. My son happened to be the winner, so I was pretty proud. But as they're running around, you know, shaking each other's hand, um, he noticed that was one athlete wasn't there. And he'd actually, his hamstring had blown up about 70 metres before the finish. Yeah. My son yeah. runs back down the track to shake his hand, shake his hand to make sure he was okay. Yeah. And from a, a personal point of view, you're so proud that that's what, he's, that's what he's doing. He's not staying at the start to, you know, pump his chest. He's gone back to make sure the other guy's okay. That, and, that's the important focus there. Like it, oh, everyone, it you want to make sure everyone's all right there. You don't want to leave anyone behind in particular because we're all competing against each other, trying to do your best. Yeah, and and I was more proud of that than the fact that he'd won. <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah, yeah. It shows empathy for other people, and yeah. uh, that, that's the important part. And and it's concern, and and he'll if he takes that forward into his life, he will succeed. Yeah. So. What's the, oh, the age of the oldest people you got uh, in the athletics club? Uh, se- at 17, 17 with little athletics. Yep. Once they, and, they turn over that, they could, they all then they're sort of pushed into the senior world. They can actually start running senior athletics from when they're 12. Yep. They yep. have competitions for them. And we have an association with Hill Seniors. So we'll we'll push our older athletes. And those who are more serious to um, to compete through um through hills like monique's uh, monique's daughter is a very good athlete very good runner she actually yeah. competes with hills seniors as well yes so uh, in regards to coaching and that so you've got so you got all how many disciplines are there in athletics out of curiosity oh um <laughs> well you've got your, your sprints your yeah. distance your middle distance your discus your shot put your javelin your long jump, your triple jump, your high jump, or let's say 10, which would be your decathlon. Yeah. And there's probably a couple in, or then you've got the walks. Um, yeah, yeah probably 10, 10, 10, 10 to 15, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've never so thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you find the coaches and pick the right coaches to be able to be in there? Uh, with the kids and help give them the right train to, to help them develop. Because obviously you don't need them to be Olympians yet, right? But you want to teach them the right fundamental skills that are going to help benefit yeah. what they do. Yeah, we um we get some of our our people, um, volunteers, to actually go and do the the basic coaching courses. Yes. Um yeah. which show which are good for learning the basics and also the officials courses and our age managers so they can then pass that on to the kids but when it comes down to specialist um type events like like sprinting or throws then we will point them towards outside coaches who we know if if they are serious about going down a particular path yep. if it's just learning and improving the basics to get your running right to get your um to learn the exercises so that you use your legs properly learn how to pump your arms because arms is what makes you go fast. Um, yep. You know, you look at some of the kids with their arms waving all over the place and you, you have a chat to them about using their arms properly and that increases their speed. Um, we teach all the basics. And if they want to go further, then we'll encourage them to go to a, a professional coach. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's good. That's a good pathway to go because it would be very hard to engage like a professional level coach at the start. And they're not going to have the time to split across such a big uh, club either with yeah. a lot of people. So they want to really take the people that are more serious about it uh, and want to go to that next level. So have you got any notable athletes that have come through the club that are engaged with the club still when oh, we've, we've had um, we had quite a few. We had um Chanel Oden well, she um was a very good um hurdler. She came back and she's been coaching for the last couple of years. And we probably won't have her this year because she's now taken on a <coughs> Uh, a cadetship with a university course. Yep. So she possibly won't have the time, unfortunately. Tom Holcomb, um, my son, um, you know, Patrick, Patrick Gleason. But we've, we've had quite a few of them come back to pass yep. their yep. skills on to the younger, younger kids. And they actually like it when they get a coach who's just a little bit older than them. There's more yep. of a that they relate better to a, a you or me. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, I've always found that with the younger kids. When I was a younger coach in soccer, I've seen that as well. So the younger kids would respond better to me than someone that's my age now. That's right. Tell them yes. what to do. So, yeah. um, but that's we're, we're just old fossils. So what can you say that's, about that's it? That's right. Well, what would you know? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Well, back in the day when there were stones and stuff, and yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and you didn't have and you didn't have Google. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, no Google. So. Um, and so talking about the technology sector, do you think that's affected the number of people uh, that are competing in sports like athletics and that these days compared to uh, what it used to be? It's a good question. I, I think the active kids voucher got a lot of kids out yeah. because the parents could, could afford it and got them to try stuff. Um, but I do think there are still too many kids sitting at home yeah. playing playing with electronics um i know from you know the experience with my kids it's they're more interested in in doing stuff with electronics and you see the kids carrying their phones around with them on a friday night and they're always yeah. looking at it and i think it would be nice if they didn't have them if they were you know prepared to put them away yeah and i i think I think that does have an impact. Um, but also saying that, I think the technology, like I said last year, being able to see the Commonwealth Games um, and be right in the athletics, seeing what was going on, really got kids focused and got their parents focused and brought more forward to, to sign up. Yep. So technology does have a part to play in making people aware. But yes. I think think it's yeah it's too much of a distraction yeah so one one thing i've seen that is probably beneficial from it is a lot of kids that they all love the self-achievement it's good and we should be encouraging people to be proud of what their achievements are whatever they are whatever level they've uh, got to with different sports and that they like it that it gets recognized and put out there and they can show people uh which, which is good. So those aspects of it are good. So, and I suppose with the social media footprint, people are aware of it, things that are out there now and perhaps more aware than what they might have been in the past when you only have print media to really cover what's going yep. on in the local sport. So otherwise you don't see it. You, you're not aware of it unless you stumble across it, come across it or are involved in it. So Yeah, and it's um, it's interesting. I Talking Alex Madocker, who was the Australian discus champion when he went to high school. He went in his school athletics carnival and it was a discus event and he's about to throw and a girl who knew him goes up to the teacher and says, oh, you need to move all those people over there. But, no, I don't need to do that. Yes, you need to move all those people. No, no, they'll be right. Anyway, Alex threw went past the people and the poor teacher nearly had kittens, but he didn't realise how far um, someone can throw. So it's just a matter of, of getting the information out there to people. And I guess social media does play a part in that. Um, but again, it's 
yeah, I mm. with the kids, I don't know. Um, I don't know whether the kids like to say, I'm going to Little Athletics on Friday night, if you're a 14-year-old boy. But you really want to say to your friends, I'm going to Little Athletics? Yeah, I don't I don't think it, it was not real cool connotations before when you were younger. People knew the guys yeah. were doing it. Um, and the ones I went to school that did it were very good, like uh, Anthony Butt, he went to the Commonwealth Games and that sort of stuff. Yep. And, Ian Garrett was a high jumper, went to the Commonwealth Games as well. Cheryl Webb was an international runner, but still, but they were exceptions. The other kids that went there, they weren't telling everyone they were doing it. That's because... right. The, the kids would see the kids would see it at the um, the school athletics carnival, and they'd suddenly go, "Wow!" You know, because I mean, my son at the school athletics carnival, he'd win the four hundred meters by about seventy meters, yeah. and kids would go, "Wow, that's you know that would really stand out," and and would earn a, a fair amount of respect. Um, but if it's just in the day-to-day chatting, well, I'm going to little athletics, you, you, you know, I, I don't know. It would be, I think it would be hard. Yeah. So transitioning-wise, do you have many of the kids that are competing in little athletics? Are they also, Ben, because they dip are they getting involved because they're trying it at school and then they like that and they get involved with the club or are they trying club and then really fall in love with the sports and so they go and try it with schools and completely embrace it? Yeah, I think it's um, a little bit of both. I don't yep. really know. I don't. I mean, my son just he knew he was a quick runner and he decided he wanted to, um, to try it out. I, I hadn't really thought of it as a sport for him. He came to me. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. That's a, that's a hard one. I mean, we look at back. If you look at them, um, the recent Matildas. Yeah. There's yep. at least four players on the team came through the little athletics. Yep. Now, there was a girl. What one of the girls played for Oakville. Yep. Oakville Court, football. Courtney, Courtney Nevin. Yep. Yeah, Courtney Nevin. Right. Um. I can't remember the names, but but some of the others actually came up through Little Athletics. And we should be getting it out, Little Athletics should be getting it out, that it was the speed that helped get them onto the Matildas. Yes, they had their ball skills, but it was Little Athletics that gave them the speed. And with football, it's soccer. It's, you know, you learn your, your ball skills at soccer but you learn your running at um, athletics. When you get to rugby, learn your speed from little athletics, but learn your ball handling through through your rugby. Yeah. I'd, I'd definitely see that now as an older person can look at it like 45-year-old. You know, there's value in doing cross-training with multiple sports functions yeah. to – to get bring out the best in whatever your sport is, so like being involved in soccer and rugby, so it would be very obvious what I should have done better. I've probably, as a young guy, done some sprint training, dedicated sprint training to get the yeah. best out of what I could do running wise, and work on the discipline of endurance running. I've I've never been able to do long endurance running. I just I can't uh, comprehend in my head how someone can just go. I'm going to run 10Ks just for a bit of fun. Like, that was not real fun yep. for me having to do that stuff. I did it for a purpose because I needed to. Um, I liked it. But, yeah, some people can just go for a run 10Ks, 15Ks, 42Ks like a marathon, and they get happy with that. That's normal. Yep. Yeah. No, it's, it's – and I mean, I look at the um, – you, you look at the rugby players um, warming up on TV. They take you to their training and what have you. And you see that they're doing all of the athletics exercises with their legs to get yeah. their sprint speed up. Right? So they're doing it at the elite level, but it's not happening at the grassroots level. Yeah. And I think it, um, it should be because that might identify more elite players or make them a little bit quicker so they get noticed. Yeah. So how much difference do you think working on those little uh, the acumen skills for how they do the explosive stepping in that straight away with the sprints, like you see the players do. How how much do you reckon they could transition these skills to other sports, even at amateur level? I, if the athlete wants to learn and then practice, um, 
because as soon as you start training, it's going to slow you down. Yes. But then once you start to learn how to do it properly, then you um, then you start to become quicker. Yeah. Once you learn out how to increase your your stride, um, you, you become quicker. So if you're running a, a, a distance, um, if you've got a set speed and you're running, um, say, 100 metres or a 400 metres, if you can increase the length of your stride by a couple of centimetres and you're still taking the same number of steps at the same speed, then you're going to get there sooner. Yeah. So you might so you're going to take a couple of seconds off. Right? If you are playing soccer and someone breaks away with the ball and you're a, a quick sprinter, you could over the 50 meters from the halfway line to the next goal, you could have two to three meters on them. Yeah. So all you have to do is is catch them and get in front of them and spoil it. Right? Yeah. And it's it's the same with with rugby. If someone kicks a ball through, and you've got the speed to get there, that you know, it's, like I said, with blocks, it's um, it's point two of a second, but point two of a second at speed, um, that could be one and a half to two meter advantage you've got. Yeah, and and that's the difference between winning and losing. Yep. Yeah. So. What do you do with uh, athletes you got? Like, so you obviously got a lot of cross functional athletes that are doing a mixture of shot put, javelin, discus. Um, have you got any of it uh, good at shot put, javelin, and discus that combine together like they're just, oh, they bomb it all together? Or they're normally people will have a mixture of a couple of good things or good at a couple of things, but not necessarily. Because I would say they're slightly more technical skills uh, doing shot put discus and javelin than some of the other events. Yeah, they're as technical as a sprinting. Um, yeah. But yeah, we find that the the ones who are strong at discus are also strong at shot put. Okay. Um, okay. Because with with discus, it comes from the speed of the discus leaving your hand. So you look at the discus um, runners doing the doing the spin. Right? So they're getting the spin in their arm, and then as they move forward, they're lifting their body from the legs, so that the tip of their fingers is spinning very quickly. It's lifting as they go forward, so that when they release the discus, the discus has got the speed from the hand. It's got the direction from the hand going up. So then it starts to fly like a flying saucer. Yeah. And when you, you look at it climb, um, that's what it does. And it comes from the, the skill and the speed of the spin. And shot puts a little bit the same. When the athlete's moving forward to throw the shot put, it's their whole body and the weight of their body that has got the momentum, which then carries into the shot put, which then gives it that throw moving forward. Um, and again, the javelin, so we tend to find that shot and discus tend to complement each other um, yep. because a lot of it comes from the legs, believe yep. it or not. Um, javelin's slightly different because it's more more the arm and getting that flow through the air because the javelins actually fly. Um, you know, we've got kids throwing javelins 40 metres, which is... That's pretty good. You know, <laughs> Well, yeah, and if you go back to where it came from, back in the old um, Achilles and Romans and what have you, if you're throwing spears 40 metres, you've got an advantage on the other guy. Yeah, yeah so, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's all there. And when you get to the the long jump and the high jump, again, it all comes from the leg, ac leg action, and a lot of it's from the, from sprinting because if you – the long jump is basically you speed down the runway to get to the takeoff point. You then throw yourself in the air and it's yeah. the momentum then carries you forward at the, from the speed of the run. Um, and running into the high jump, you're coming in using your legs and you look at the way they're using their legs. It's very much a sprinting type shape to then lift you up, up yeah. and over. And then when you come to sprinting, again, it's... Um, it's, if you're at a, a tartan track 
and there's a sprinter coming towards you, if everything is working, you don't hear them yeah. because their spikes are hitting the tartan directly under their body and their leg is basically pushing and, and the momentum of the body carries them forward as they then bound into the next next stride um, and the arms. And if you look at them and if you look at their head, um, it doesn't move. You could almost put a glass of champagne on the top of their head and it wouldn't spill, right? Yeah. That's if everything's working and they're in the zone. It's just a body moving forward with legs doing what legs need to do and arms doing what arms need to do and they they move and it's 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 very it's it's nice to watch um the middle distance runners um they're a, a heavier type style um but again it's getting everything working in unison so you can keep on going and not putting too much strain on your on your heart and everything else yeah and so they do a lot of um stuff outside of training the, the kids that are good at the athletics they're obviously doing extras to help improve what they what they do in their performance overall yeah a lot of it a lot of it comes from the the core strength in your in your stomach which which holds it all together and that doesn't really come till you get to eight or nine right yeah um and the typical <laughs> typical phone call i get um around school athletics time is oh I didn't know my my daughter could could run, and she just run the hundred meters at school, and she's going to zone. Can we get her some coaching before she goes to zone? That'll that'll help her, <laughs> or or high jump. And I say, well, yes, you can, but it won't be for this year's zone. It'll be for next year's zone. Yeah, because we can't teach someone in two weeks um, what they need to do, but come along and over the next twelve months, then we can improve the style increase the speed um to get it right yeah well that's what it is it's training discipline and repetitive training teaches your skill set which can take into all the different events yeah that's yeah and you're building up your strength i know most um most training is is building up your core strength it's building up concentrating on your style concentrating yeah. on your stretching um yeah you know, a 400 meter runner typically when they're training doesn't run 400 meters. Yeah. They yeah. might do um, a number of 80 meter wind sprints where they'll sprint 80 meters and walk back. They might do 10 or 15 of those. They might do a number of um, 200 meter or 300 meters, but they don't do 400. Yeah. But the, the way they have built up their fitness when the day comes to run the 400, it's just, it's just a breeze. Yeah. But you know, I used to look at that when I train people too for sports. I used to focus when I had training. You I want players to be able to perform at a maximum peak level for ninety minutes, but that wasn't yep. wasn't true in soccer. Yep, it was more like two forty five minute blocks. Right, so I used to, and I only looked at this the last couple of years as I got older. Just training, training wrong. It's set up for people to go for ninety minutes, and um, they reach a level where they can't go any higher so everyone will get to their optimum level whatever that is yep. if you train them to go for 90 minutes well they're gonna hit that level a bit slower and it won't be quite as high as if you set it up so yep. and they train for 45 minutes and have been more explosive but you might yep. have fatigue as an issue that will come into the back end of games and stuff so yeah. It was in, an interesting uh, workaround when these things got pointed out to me by some more professional sports people so do it yeah and it always fascinates me with the um professional football the soccer is they they actually show you the distance the athletes cover yeah through the game yeah and you think they've run seven kilometers <laughs> yeah that's right oh this look this guy i remember brett edmonton played one game for the soccer roos and he ran 17.2 kilometers or something they said oh that's close to a record so well, yeah be close to a record so up up and down the park 170 times so Yep. That's a, that's and a lot, a lot of it's yeah, a lot of it's sprinting. Yeah. But short oh, yeah. sprints. Yeah. You've got to concentrate on the on the short sprints and 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 being able to recover um between them. But yeah, it's you've got to look at it that way. Yeah. 
So for this upcoming season for Rouse Hill Rams Little Athletics Club, have you got any yep. big events or anything you want to get out there for everybody so they know mm-hmm. how to how they can get in touch or engage with it or start coming yeah. involved if they missed the start of the registrations and stuff? Yeah, well, being athletics, you can you can join anywhere through the through the season. But yeah. our, our big events are um, state relays, which is the end of November. The kids love um, – they all love relays. It's uh, – yeah. Um, and we just put teams together within the club because it's a, yeah. it's a great, fun, fun weekend, and that's held in at Homebush. Um, next is our zone carnival, which is held at um, Roxborough Park, Hills Grounds. That's in December. I think it's the first weekend in December. Um, and then from there, you're qualifying to go through to region. Region will be held in February. Yep. Um, and it's the top It's the top two go through to region, plus the next, I think it's the next two fastest across all of the other zones. Yep. So, And we're a very competitive zone. So normally um, we get three to four through in most events. To get That's through the good. region, oh, it is, yeah, um, and then from region you go through to through to state, yep, and that's yeah, in that's, uh, that's in March, about twentieth of March. Yeah, that that's a good process. So Monique told me about how at the state chip, I think it was at state championships earlier this year, there were big storms or something like that, and delays. oh, that was that was region out at Campbelltown. <laughs> yeah, she told me about that. So it yeah. sounded like it was an interesting event, and they. Uh, down delay it from the lightning and all this sorts of yep. stuff that was oh, happening. Yeah. And then we had to readjust the program and <laughs> oh, we upset people because things weren't being timed at the right time. <laughs> yeah. But, so, um, but no. athletes set themselves up for particular days and all this stuff as well. Once they get to a more elite level, don't they? So like, Oh, absolutely. Throw yeah. their programs to like yeah. all buggery really. Yeah. And especially if you're competing in multiple events, Right. Yeah. Because if you're um, you, you want to have recovery time between your events, and when something gets blown out of the the water, then you're um, then you're you're caught. And it's also um, sometimes we might have to go back to a a timed result. So with the hundred meters, you you have heats, and then yeah. it's the top. I think it's the top four from each heat go through to another heat. And then we eventually get down like they do at the Olympics to the final, yeah. the final eight. Um, but sometimes, and typically what happens at school carnivals is their um, their timed events. They just run heats and yeah. they take the fastest times across all of the heats. So unless you're running as if it was a final in your heat, you may not, you may not get through. Yeah. That's that's very hard because most athletes train themselves the objective is to get to the next next heat yeah i'm not trying to win the final in the first heat all i know i just have to be in the first two i just have to be in the first two now i have to win it because i've got to the final yeah and that's that's where it becomes hard when the weather comes and mucks up the program yeah so it goes straight to so what did they do? They picked out. How did they work out who was going to do what? Then they just picked the the crew. Oh, all the, all the or... events were were still done, um, but because we, we were running out of time, instead of doing doing heats up to a final, they just ran the heats and took the fastest times from the heats. But the athletes oh, yeah. were told, right? So yeah. it wasn't like they were going in, um, you know, cold. But it's it's a little bit like. If someone's pushing you, it's um you gotta have a bunny to chase, right? Yeah. And if there's no bunny there, you may not push yourself as hard. Yeah. And that's what that's where the mental strength comes into it. Yeah. And um as I've seen in the past from other athletes competed with, they compete as hard as the athletes around them. So if you're in a really hot race in a good competitive heat with a lot of other strong runners you're going to need to bring out your best you're going to be at a higher level than perhaps what you are if you're against it's hard to say average right because people are going to that level are not average but if you're against people that are not at the absolute top one percent you're probably not going to necessarily need to bring that top to get you'll do the result you need to do to 
getting the win. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you go, you're going for the win, but you don't want to exert yourself or hurt yeah. yourself yes. because you have another event to go to. Yeah, that's right. You just you just need to put the effort in to win. That's, yeah. It's, fa it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> the, the whole athletic, all the disciplines just amaze me. I thought one day I want to try to give a slap at all of them again as a bit of an older guy, see how I go. Uh, unfortunately, people that do athletics when they get a bit older, they are serious and they're good at it. So I look very yes. bad. <laughs> I've got a good start on base, but anyway, to work with is it be not good and then get to better than not good and then hopefully much better than not good. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're very efficient and know how yeah. to do it. Yeah, that's yeah, right. It's, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. so you're also involved with Pitt Town Football Club as the secretary, I am. as yes. you told me before. Yeah, how did you get involved secretary. with that? Oh, again, it was um, it was just with the kids, yep. Um, yep. playing football. You go along. Um, we need someone to be the manager of the team. Oh, well, I put my hand up and become the manager and then the club needs help um, on the committee. So I'm around. So, yeah. oh, and, and I've been lucky in that I've had the time. Um, I mean, I had my kids late in, late in life, so I wasn't yeah. trying to run a, run a career. I'd already done that. Yeah. So, yes. you know, I, I, could, I had the time to put into the kids and, and help the, the clubs and, yeah. and I enjoy it. I'm yep. also involved in Pony Club. Again, yep. that was my my daughter. I'm still in Pony Club. So. That's good. So I wrote an article about Pony Club, actually. So um, a couple of months ago, I interviewed Shan Haskins, and she is a delightful uh, young girl to have a chat to, Londonderry Pony Club. So yep. um, yeah, it's great. So I found out a lot about that. I didn't know about it as well. So it's good. So... From football perspective, so Pitt Town started off at Ebley Park. Then, were, well, you told me they were part of Oakville and they're, they're separated there. They separated, and, yep. That was about 30 years ago. Yep. So I do remember so plenty of times I've seen the juniors playing at Oakville Oval after I used to play Ebley Park when I was playing juniors there, yep. uh, back down in Pitt Town itself. And that was the it was the weirdest field in the Perm. When I was in goals, a couple of times <laughs> I'd, I'd taken – kick outs from being in goals and put shots onto the crossbar because uh number one I can kick the ball. Number two, it's not the longest field and it runs down the hill. So And it's a big it's a big hill. <laughs> yeah, and you you can get ten meters out of your kicks if you know what you're doing. So oh, and yeah. uh yeah it's uh, a, a different field. So that's all I say. It wasn't bad. It was just different. Psychologically it was different too when people could do a clearance kick from back in the own goals. The next thing you're yeah. watching a shot sail on target, like as a keeper, like, oh, here we go, better switch on. So, yeah, we, um, we still train, we still train there. Yeah. <laughs> don't actually play there, but um, yeah, we still train there. So, so where's the new proposed field act? I know at the moment what the seniors are playing at Pitt Town Sports Club. Um, we play our competition games at Pitt, Pitt Town Sports Club. Yeah. Um, yeah. The juniors play at Oakville Oval. Our over yep. 35, um, our real weekend warriors, they play um at Berger Road because yep. we don't have we don't have the lights to support night competition. Yep. Right. But our new facility, Fernadale, that's in Pitt Town itself. And that should uh, they're starting work on it this year. So hopefully we'll be there in one to two years. Yep. And that's two two fields. Yeah, that that'll be a nice fit. So uh, I know Damien told me I was chatting to him last year. Damien Solvens, yep. uh, but they really appreciated the support the guys they got with Bly Park to be able to help make the side happen because there were some guys from Bly Park, oh. there were some guys from Pitt Town that weren't enough for one. Yep. Now Pitt Town's fortunate enough to have two sides or three sides for thirty five. We've this year. we've got three over thirty fives this year. Yeah, so it's Very it's it's our it's our growth age group. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's funny when you say it like that. The, the growth yeah, age group and the old men of the club, are the growth age group yeah. of the club. Yep, yeah. and they all live in all the old men in Pitt Town. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. So uh, I really appreciate your time today. It's been great having a chat about athletics and also Pitt Town Football Club and just getting an insight into you and um, what it takes to get the athletics club going. Uh, is there anyone you'd like to give a shout out to or anything like that or any sponsors you'd like to uh, promote or give a shout out to to help uh, 
the athletics club or Pitt Town Football Club over the years. Look, our, our biggest sponsor, um, oh, for for football, it's it's WAG and um, Windsor Auto Group. They've they've been a great supporter for us. Um, yeah. Cooks Plumbing are a major sponsor for us at um at athletics. Um, yeah. they're really good and and they're just down in McGrath's Hill. I mean, it's a great place to go and do your your. I, I say to people, I do my plumbing shopping down there. Yeah. Because you, you're talking to plumbers. <laughs> it's it's really good. Um, you know, the fiddlers are main a main sponsor for us. Um yeah. but yeah, we we got a few businesses around little small businesses around the, the district and we we pump them on our um Facebook page and website. Yeah, it's important to have all them because uh all those mum and dad businesses and the little businesses, they're the ones uh they're the bread and butter ones that will keep the club going. So it's good having good corporate <laughs> sponsors as well. It is. It is. And it gets their name out and, and it gets people to to go there and, and, and spend some money. Yeah. And they're keeping it in the area. A- absolutely. So that's what attracts me most about the community sports. Community sports are tied in with community-related businesses at, at whatever level they're at. Yeah. But those people put their money into helping the sports clubs run and they – just want the support of the clubs to do the same thing, put money back in through them, whether it's a butcher shop or whether it's a bottle shop or yep. someone selling art or whatever it is, like a clothing store. Let's let's get behind the people involved in these sports clubs and help uh, keep Absolutely. the sports clubs running, help keep these people in business. Yeah. No, it's it's we're, we're there for each other. We're all part of it. We're part of the same community. That's so. right. Uh, that's, that's the big thing. So... I've seen since coming out of COVID, I really think that um, community involvement with uh, different events that happen in the community now, I think it's a lot stronger perhaps than what it was prior to COVID. So I think there's a bit of dissolvement. Like now everyone's got freedom again. They're going and doing things again, but people are supporting the local community sports and people are supporting the local community shops and that because we don't want to lose them because we've lost a lot of stuff when everything come through COVID. No, and it's it's just having the interaction with people. Yeah, it's no, just getting absolutely. there and meeting them. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. All it's all part of mental health and well being as well, which is yeah. uh, paramount yeah. in the community. I, the I've moment. got I've got to say that the the best part I enjoy about athletics is in December when I get to dress up as Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you do a good Santa too. So. Uh, yeah. I I, I start. I let the beard grow and it gets a little yeah. bit long and, and I love yeah. it when the kids, you know, are you a real Santa? And I say, yes. And I, and I said, and you know how you can tell? And I just, I pull my beard. Yeah. <laughs> they go, oh. Yeah. Oh, it's a real deal. Yeah. No, it's funny. It's, it, it's good. And then, you know, I'm there with the kids and it's say, now, what would you want for Christmas? Now you need, you need to call it out nice and loud so your parents can hear. Yeah. So that um, you know, don't hold back on the money. Just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That uh, yeah. I, I may have been a Santa's assistant last year for the radio station, and had some little kids saying what they wanted for Christmas, and Mum had a pen and some paper writing down a yep. list. This little girl goes, "I want a pony, and I want this, and I want a Ferrari, and I like helicopter." And Mum yep. just goes. Santa doesn't have those things this year. And I went, yeah, we're having troubles getting the <laughs> getting the elves making these things. So, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's um, yeah, it's it's all it's all good fun, and I I just enjoy it, enjoy yeah, spending absolutely. time with the kids. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Bob, thank you very much for your time. It's been a good chat. Um, um so for everybody that's watching this now, I'm going to put this up on Duckman TV a bit later on, and it'll become a podcast on Weekend Warriors too. I'll share it uh, to you, Bob, or you can share with the club and Monique as well, so you can get it through all the social media things as well. Uh, Thanks for your time. Uh, Keep on ducking, everyone, and uh, you'll catch me again sometime a bit later on. All right. Thank you. Thanks.